Real African stories, real African experiences. This is the Legally Clueless video series proudly powered by Guinness Black Shines Brightest. Stay tuned to the end to find out more. And in this episode, Victor shares his story of going from painting signs to painting murals on an entire iconic building in Nairobi. So, my name is Victor Wangi, also known as Victor Wangi. I am from Nairobi, Kenya. I am a mural artist. Uh, what I do is large scale painting. It doesn't matter the size of the building. Like, um, I'm a painter through and through. So, I can paint on paper, I can paint on canvas but I mostly prefer to work on uh, buildings and walls and uh, from very small sizes to very huge walls. That's what I mostly enjoy. I just pretty much found myself here, but I, I grew up in Kiambu. So growing up was a, uh, Kiambu has this very village uh, sort of like, a, it's a village setup. So I had a full village experience. I didn't see a lot of things until I was too old <laughs> and in the city already what i mean by village life is uh from what i can remember it was very brown like i feel like it's only recently that i've started to see color in the 2010s it was very brown like the whitest whites were a bit creamish so uh growing up i grew up in a very small small scale farm and uh Basically, it was farm life. We, we had a couple of cows. They practically raised us because, you know, there, there is that entire process where, like, we have cows, we take care of these cows, and they give us milk to uh, pay for your school and all that. So that was what growing up in Kiambu was, was like. And then it's actually very close. From where I grew up, you can see the entire Nairobi skyline. Um, sort of like when you look, uh, into the horizon, that's what you see. And you can see the city lights, but you're still very much isolated. Like in my experiences growing up, there was um, going to basically uh, harvest coffee in the huge, uh, huge farms owned by corporations. So we'd go uh, do that during holidays. And when I, when I was still in school, there were people who would go do that during schooling uh, they would basically run away from school abscond school and just go do that you know i think at, at around that time i was in between class one and class five um a barrel a barrel of coffee basically to go harvest that to pick that coffee uh, you'd get paid around 20 shillings to 40 shillings mm -hmm. and uh, as a villager uh, as a village kid that's a lot of money there is so much you can do, so many places you can pass by. So I remember the first time we went to collect coffee, I went with my brother. Uh, he's a lawyer now, but yeah, friends of his basically um, uh, basically called us and they told us that they were going to pick coffee. So I tagged along. I was in class one, that was in the year 2000. When I went, I remember I was very tired, but my mom had packed lunch for us. So I was very tired by around 11, so I wanted to just go home. I didn't manage to get an entire, say, barrel. So a bucket, it was a bucket. So in the evening, his friends and my brother basically like pulled so that I, I had like one bucket to get paid for. I got paid 20 shillings. By I got home with one shilling. Like I gave my dad one shilling. So that's pretty much what Kiambu was like, growing up in Kiambu was like. I had actually, I was born in Nairobi, but we went to Kiambu when I was around five, six-ish. So um, my first language was Swahili. But when you go to a village setting where no one is speaking to you in Swahili, uh, basically your life, you know, your language, what you know, tends to flip over. And uh, I, I remember I used to draw. We had this mica table and my dad, my dad is an artist as well. Not professionally, but he has the gift. So he would draw on their mica table or on paper with a pencil and uh, I'd follow through. Like I wanted to see what that was like. I think that made my mom mad <laughs> to an extent because she's the one who had to clean after us. But I remember I was just interested. I was keen on doing that. My earliest memory of me doing anything artistic was when I was in nursery school. I don't remember what nursery school I went to uh, oddly enough. So my desk mate drew a car 
it was a triangular car, like a triangular matchstick car. And I was so sure that cars didn't look like that. I was so sure, like, you know, this it should look a bit different. So I, I was there helping him, helping my friends basically do that. Uh, but I did not think at that moment that there was anything artistic in what I was doing. I just felt like it was right, you know. So we went to a village set up and I just continued doodling. It's very hard to basically get my attention to do anything. I'm a very, I'm a scatter brain. My, my mind is all over. When I get bored, I doodle, I draw. And that's pretty much how I coped with everything. Because school was boring. There was barely anything that was interesting enough. Like um, when I was in class, uh, from class one to class five, we had fights with my teachers because of how, how much space the drawings in my school books had taken. Because I would do schoolwork from the front of the page and then I would start drawing from the back page. And some way, some way, I think the, <laughs> the drawings would uh, occupy almost the entire book. So that was, that was pretty much what was happening. And because my parents also got an idea that I was a very distracted kid, they transferred me to a now boarding school. Like, looking back, I can see how my life was mapped out. If I had stayed in Kiambu, schooled in Kiambu, it was very, I would have become a, I would have started working very young. There was access to money, town is very close by, you only pay 20 bob. Though back in the day, you only pay 20 bob and you're in town, you get to do a job or two, go back home. And when you're a kid, that life is very enticing. The quick money, the construction sites, the farming where you get paid to do those odd jobs, it is very enticing. So yeah, I went to boarding school. Um, when I went to boarding school, I was shipped to a school in Makweni, in a place called uh, Kiboko. There is, a, there is a research center by Kari, the Kenya Agricultural Research Institute. Um, now it changed its name, I don't know to what now. but. Um, what was there was a research center and the researchers, because they had kids, um, schooling kids and all that, they, uh, this institution uh, had created a school for these kids, primary school. And that was back in the 80s. Uh, my dad is an artist, he can draw, but he did a completely, he, he went into, into something completely different, uh, something to do with livestock management, range management. And that is what Kari was all about and that research center. So he sort of like knew about that school. These kids, uh, this school was a high performing school in the middle of nowhere. Um, there was like a forest surrounding the entire school. So you couldn't escape, but you find yourself trapped there and the only thing to do because of where it was, it was at was just to study. Yeah. And there was a lot of pressure to just, just study. That was the only thing you could do there. So I went there from class six to class eight. That's why I did my KCE, PE. And then when I was there, um, I came across a newspaper article. I don't remember whether, whether I was in class six or class seven, but it was about a prominent Kenyan artist, Kenyan visual artist. I, I wanted to be a lot of things when I was a kid, but this was about a prominent Kenyan artist. His name is Kariuki Kafiri, I think, who'd sold a sketchbook to a Japanese couple for around 60,000. You know, 60,000 in, early 2000s was a lot of money and I was keen on, you know, I was curious. I had wanted to be a lot of things. I was pretty much, I was a bit bright, like not, not the sharpest kid in the class, but I was a bit bright. I knew that if I had put my uh, mind to it, I could be pretty much anything, but I was too distracted to be that. So I now became very interested in becoming a visual artist. I thought the best way to do that was by basically studying hard, going to a good school, picking up architecture later, and then I could become an architect practicing uh, visual art, uh, practicing art. But that did not happen. When I went to high school, it was when I was, uh, the year I was supposed to be enrolling was in 2008. That was when there was post-election violence. So. I was called to a school that was still in Makweni, Makweni boys. And I did not like the idea of going back to Makweni because that's where, it's a hardship area. 
it's not a really you know it's not a it's not a very beautiful place to be in really it's, it's a hardship area so i was thinking to myself that i wanted to go somewhere else but just not there so and ideally it would have been really nice if i could go to a school that had an arts program so pretty much all of the national schools i applied to had an art program like they they taught art in their curriculum so yeah my dad took it upon himself like he walked around he went to the schools asking about whether i could get a slot in until he went to one of those schools and a teacher there told him that you are looking for a school for your kid that has an arts program and makweni boys already has an art program <laughs> so uh, he came back home talked to me told me that look these things are like this and it's a tough year so you have to understand but this school has something you like and maybe just give it a chance and I, i found myself back there again so this school had art in the curriculum and that's exactly what i was going there to do anyway like i might have dropped other all the other subjects that's that's exactly what i just wanted to do so i got to this school and um, there was that element of discipline when you're doing art not not as a hobby but as a subject there is a discipline that is instilled in you um i think uh, maybe someone who has not done that might think about it in a totally different angle but now it's sort of like judged and uh it's it's objective you're trying to meet certain objectives so my high school went pretty quickly like the high school years i i don't remember anything about about that because i was mostly held up in the art studio a lot of things passed passed by me like like a time my classmate uh, sorry not my classmate my deskmate was in a squad that was trying to burn down the school but i did not know anything about it because i was in the art studio and it was actually my dorm my dorm room where i used to sleep so i was i was that clueless about a lot of things kcsc happened i was under age i was looking for sign writing jobs because i wanted to get a bit of experience and when you're coming from a place like kiambu where you don't have any uh, connections and any you don't have you're not in touch with any of the uh, professional practicing artists you really have no idea of where to start from and for me the easiest and the best way to sort of like start uh, from where i was seated was by going into sign writing but i never got a single job so instead i had to i had to do construction and uh, basically like you know pocket money had dried up to raise money to support myself at that time because i was still a teenager not yet an adult i was just somewhere in between and um, i did a lot of farm work as well in between there and of all the work that i did the only thing that i probably really liked was trimming hedges like i'm i'm really good at that and it got to a point where people would hire me to trim their hedges so if right now like if i quit doing murals and like went to live a very simple life i think that's what i would do for a living i'd just trim hedges that's important because later that's that's pretty much what now led me to murals so i enrolled into to a university that was in 2012 and now things got more serious it was more intense it was a very interesting point in my life you know he's a village kid zero internet zero exposure to what's going on in the world now super exposed to everything i was almost overwhelmed it's like um i don't know how exactly i can explain this but i think it should be what it should feel like for a kid to first experience sugar you know it's too conflicting too many things happening at once and i was hooked i was i was like this is this is really nice and at the same time i could see my level of skill of skill uh, and how it sort of like translated across my peers so yeah that was pretty much what my university years were like so when now it comes to murals um it started with me doing huge paintings and the thing is paintings are sort of like limited by the size of people's houses you do a really huge painting and it becomes a problem because now there is no one that uh, can accommodate it in their houses like it's a brilliant painting they really love it but they can only like say look at it and pass pass by it it's like having a truck 
in in a residential parking you know or parking a train in in the middle of town simply doesn't work so there has to be structures so with my background in trimming hedges it basically that had taught me to uh, create something and just step back you know when i was creating small paintings i was not getting the satisfaction that i wanted it felt a lot like it was not enough until i started doing huge paintings and i felt that satisfaction now start to come in so with huge paintings it was more challenging because creating a huge piece is actually a lot of work the bigger it gets the more work there is you know and you could as well as do just a small painting you just paint on an a4 and just go home but i was keen on doing something bigger so yeah i was stuck there and i realized that i really loved huge challenges you know so it took a while then it transitioned to walls and now i could not get enough of walls like i just wanted to work on walls so at around this time i'm also finishing a uh, university and i really want to paint on walls but i'm not getting any walls then samsung samsung came calling i remember i had just finished my end of, uh, basically the for the uh, exams it was an exhibition it was very intense like it was raining um it rained so heavily at one point that our brushes and gallons of paint were carried away like it it was an in a school setting where you can imagine kids bringing your br uh, your brushes from like 200 meters away being like hey i think this is yours and you know that's how hard and heavily it rained plus we got pretty frustrated we had undershot the budget by so much so it was tiring work you know it's basically like being a construction worker at one point i remember we painted what we thought was a very brilliant yellow uh, in in the evening so that we could cover more ground and when we came in the next day we discovered that it was actually a brown it was not yellow so that's yeah but it taught us a lot so at around the same time because i had just finished my university i had managed to talk to some guys and they offered me studio space in railway museum a place called railway museum there used to be studio spaces for artists there so now uh, i was starting to meet more people that we were in the same industry with and mentors people who are you know ahead of us and all that so i remember showing that project to a friend of mine he looked at it and he asked me how we had done it so i told him that that was pretty easy you know took chalk we sketched the project and uh, we painted and to him he he didn't understand how we used chalk so the perfect analogy to explain this is if you needed to wash a street or if you needed to you know clean a house a huge house and you using a brush or using a chalk uh, a piece of chalk to draw or to sketch is a lot like using a toothbrush to clean an entire street but now when you sketch using say something like spray paint it's a lot like using a mop you cover more ground so this guy was like i don't believe that you guys used um, chalk because you could have actually done way more and covered more ground if you had used spray paint you know like if you walk around nairobi you see there are huge excess that are drawn on illegal structures using spray paint on buildings it would be really hard if they did that with chalk you know you have to go up close and personal to do that so now that introduced me to something else like it gave me it made me curious and want to do that to to understand how spray paint what like yeah that's pretty much how i got into spray painting so a lot of times i do projects in internal spaces like in offices and um, i do projects in people's homes so I'll, I'll come across people who know my work because they've gone to a particular office but the most obvious and iconic project that i've done is a project that is in the middle of town Haile Selassie Avenue next uh, in between Central Bank and uh, Cooperative Bank it's in um, Extelcom's house so now this goes back to me going back to you know Railway Museum when i used to go to Railway Museum there is a bridge the poster bridge that goes to I don't know city square poster city square from Times Tower and i used to pass by to, to go across Haile Selassie 
every single day. And every single day, I would see Excelcom's house. A lot of people don't know that building, but it's, it's a very unique building, has a very unique facade. Like it has floating tiles and all that. And I thought to myself, this building would look incredible if it had art on it. It doesn't have to be mine. It just could be anyone's. I thought that for, for a very long time because this is a place I used to go to every single day, pass by there, look at it, and I don't even know who the architect is, but it's part of the buildings that were built during the 70s. So it's a very brutalistic architecture and in line with all of those other buildings. So yeah, at one point, I tweeted about it when it was still owned by Telcom. So yeah. But it ended up being, I tweeted that I wanted to, to paint that building and forgot about that, that tweet. And then after that, a lot of things happen. I go to Australia and I'm doing projects there. So now, out of the blues, um, Wallace Kantai, he's the uh, communications director at Central Bank. He hits me up via a DM and he's like, hey, are you back or are you still in Australia? I was like, um... I'll, I'll tell you when I'm back. So when I got back, I told him that now I'm back, you, we can talk. We can talk about, you know, what you, have, what you had in mind. And then he told me that he just called me at some time. I gave him my contact and I forgot about it. So I was running errands. I went to drop something in around Junction and I took a bus. I remember I took a bus back to, to town. And when I was in community, community area in Upper Hill, Going back to town, I got the call from Alice. He was like, hi, are you in a place you can talk? And I was like, sure. Because that bus was quite quiet. It was a very as a quiet bus. I was in traffic, nothing was happening. So he told me that the governor saw your tweet about you wanting to paint Extelcom's house. And he's interested in making that happen. So I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Then we can get that done because I'm available. They told me that they had acquired that building and wanted to do a mural on it. So um, I got back when lockdown had started. Like there was lockdown, you know, curfew and all that. So we had to design the murals for that building. And we had to execute those murals in, at the height of COVID. So there was curfews and, you know, everything was just messed up. So yeah, it was a very intense project. For every project you see, for every mega project that is like four, three, four months of designing that go into it, conversations and, you know, change this, change that before we actually get to the ground. That was pretty much what happened. Yeah, that's how the tweet changed and, you know, manifested into reality. But that was the most intense project I've ever done. At one point, I had a kind of deep hit by the door for every time, like, uh, when I woke up, took a shower, and I was stepping out to go to work because we'd start our days very early and we'd close very late just to cover the most ground during that project. But I have an incredible team. Those guys got me through that. And it was an amazing experience. It was a really amazing experience. I think every story matters. Um, I sort of like realized this in a very weird way, in a very inanimate way. I realized this when doing watercolor paintings. So with watercolor paintings, you make very faint marks with, you know, paint, like paint that has a lot of water. And in the end, you realize that every mark, every mark matters. Every mark you put down there is visible. Sometimes people downplay their impact, but what we creators do is really important. And when it comes to, you know, there is this huge pressure that, you know, you are an African creative, you're trying to do something that's probably not been done by anyone else uh, ahead of you. So you're the pioneer and you have all of this pressure to just you know to excel sometimes just just do you just do you you know you're just going through life like everybody else but at the same time it's important to realize that what you're doing matters it's just something that might not occur to you at that exact moment but later when you're looking back at your trajectory and your story you'll sort of like realize that you know what I did at this point translated to this happening in this point. Like the fact that me doing murals comes from me doing, you know, trimming hedges. I made that connection very late in life, but 
I sort of like got used to it and accepted that. Something I did not really like doing, but I uh, don't mind doing, is what has translated to what I now do. So sometimes things happen, things are connected like that, you know, just do you. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Legally Clueless Powered by Guinness. Be sure to check out the new Guinness Black Shines Brightest Stories show that spotlights some of Kenya's most amazing and bold artists within the food, dance, fashion and creative arts, showcasing our rich culture and the future of Kenyan art within Africa and beyond. You can catch all these incredible stories right now on the Guinness Kenya YouTube channel. And remember, you can catch all new Legally Clueless podcast episodes every Monday across all podcasting platforms, as well as new Legally Clueless video episodes on Fridays, only right here on the Legally Clueless YouTube channel.